I find that sometimes people show up for a storytelling event, they don't really necessarily feel clear about what they're going to get, and then after the first story is about two-thirds of the way through, there's sort of an appreciable, like, in the room. As people decide, okay, I am now feeling relatively okay that I came to this. So I, I hope that's what's happening for you. Um, but in case it's not, I'm going to skip right on to the next story pretty quick before you have a chance to escape. Um, this story is called Hiddur Mitzvah. On Fridays for Shabbos, we bring out the Shabbos things, the items made beautiful by custom and law. Hiddur Mitzvah is the Hebrew term for this. The enhancing of a good deed by making the objects used in it beautiful as a way to sanctify the act and praise Hashem who commanded it. In our house, as in many houses with multiple generations of Jews and Jewish relatives, the objects are, well, hodgepodge would be a kind <coughs> term. We have two challah covers, one that my husband Ishai was given as a gift upon the occasion of his conversion to Judaism, and one that my mother needlepointed for me while she was going through her needlework phase because no one wanted a new talus. <laughs> <laughs> you can't keep a needle pointer down. <laughs> Our Shabbos candlesticks are an old brass pair that I must have paid cash for at some stage that I don't remember, and have used off and on for 20 years or so. I'm reluctant to buy myself a set when I know that both of my grandmothers, who are still living, have beautiful ones that I will want to use when the time comes. These, in the meantime, have a somewhat utilitarian nature, but they're familiar and therefore comforting. Our kiddish cup belonged to my Nana Janie, my great-grandmother in my maternal line, and I will just say about that, if you've never had the experience of watching your toddler wrap their chubby little baby paws around their great great grandmother's kiddish cup and take a baby sip of Shabbos wine from her wedding present. It's pretty great. <laughs> we try to always have guests for Shabbos dinner on a Friday night. We don't always manage to get to shul on a Saturday morning because Saturday mornings are gay dad's day at the local queer center on the first Saturday and queer parents mixer on the third Saturday and that is also part of the deal. We want to make sure, for good and all, that our son Stanley knows plenty of other kids with queer parents and as many other kids with transgender parents as we can manage, which isn't easy, but is certainly not impossible. And at the same time, I grew up in a synagogue and all the grown-ups had known me forever. And my memories of kiddish and laughter and making holidays with the same people my whole childhood are so present and kept me connected to my congregation and to Judaism, even when the forces of queerness seemed like maybe they were going to push me further away. The Sostecks, the Friedlanders, the Weisses, the Arbites, they welcomed baby queer me with tenderness and ran interference with my parents about it for a decade. <laughs> but Friday nights, we get the job done. Challah from the Harvard Bakery, where they keep our challah for us in a paper bag marked Bergman to make sure we always get one. I'm not always the one to pick it up, but Ishai, who is a Jew by choice and whose last name is Wallace, decided that we might get on the list faster with a recognizably <laughs> Jewish surname. <laughs> I light candles. We make scooping motions with our hands and pour the Shabbos light over each other and our son and, if they're into it, our guests. <laughs> we pour a kiddish cup of wine and share it. We make a mozi, the blessing over the bread, and then Ishai and I feed each other the first morsel, which still feels really nice. The candlelight does what candlelight is supposed to do, especially in conjunction with wine. And <laughs> it's all very peaceful. 
even when the little dude starts campaigning for ice cream 10 seconds after dinner has started. He gets ice cream on Shabbos. That's what he remembers. First candles, and then wine, and then ice cream. <laughs> so where is it? <laughs> and we invite people to share. Our kitchen table seat six, and we can, with judicious use of stools and a certain amount of attention paid to the width of each individual guest, manage to stretch it to eight. We try to make a mix. Uh, some people with whom we've shared a lot of Shabbos, and some who are new friends. It takes a certain level of tolerance to come to Shabbos dinner at our house, since the hosts disappear in turn after dinner is over to bathe the little chatterbox and then put him to bed, and people are frequently hijacked into command performances of story reading. Stanley does not like to feel left out. Bringing friends and family to Shabbos dinner when you have a little kid is a way to make sure you get to see them, since we pretty much go to bed at 10 these days. But it's also a way to make sure that Stanley never remembers not knowing them. To make sure they feel like family, like Mishpacha, his Auntie Abby and his Sparkle Chris, and his Tanta Hannah and his uncles Nick and Cyrus, and his baby cousin Amelie, to whom he is not, in any sense, related, except that, absolutely, these people are his family. I think I was a little older when I first discovered that you could use these kinds of words, words that are heavy with default meaning, uh, to make space for relationships that not everybody can understand. My son's got a couple cousins like this, including Morgan, the teenager that I usually shorthand to my niece, even though the actual explanation has no siblings in it whatsoever. Mahisha, my husband, refers to her as the household teenager. Stanley calls her his cousin. She sometimes refers to us as her uncles, and then also sometimes her other parents. I think of them as words that already have so much meaning they won't mind, or honestly, even notice if we slip our meaning in there as well. People don't ask her, they just assume, oh, your uncle, the brother of your mother or your father. No one jumps straight to, oh, your uncle, the husband of your parents' former live-in lover. <laughs> I consider this a failure of imagination. <laughs> so now we have this kid of our own. This kid whose family tree is practically bent double with relatives of assorted <clears throat> kinds, blood, and marriage, and wine, and glitter. Mm -hmm. My parents' closest friends, our closest friends, legitimate blood relations, and the people who declared upon Stanley's arrival in the world their intention to be his family. The person whose proper title, if we're being literal about the thing, is the person with whom Papa, that's me, I'm Papa, has had the longest and most tumultuous working relationship and love affair <clears throat> of his life, claimed for herself the title Fairy God's Mother. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I could grade and assign distinctions, sure, in town, out of town, related by blood or marriage or wine or glitter. But I don't, for two reasons. One, too many people are in more than one category, and then also, what's the fun in that? Part of what I adore about the family that has coalesced around our Shabbos table and around our son is how magnificently diverse it is in every way. How many genders and sensibilities and sets of interests and politics and points of view, how many tattoos and how many piercings, how many racial and ethnic and cultural combinations, and possibly most of all, how very befuddled my parents are <laughs> in the recognition that their grandson is also related to this melange of people, which means that there is some way however slender it might be, in which they are also related to them. <laughs> His fairy godmother, Kate, who's never met her own grandchildren, 
because she's estranged from her only child, carries photos and video of Stanley on her phone and shows them off almost as much as I do. Pretty close, actually. His grandspunkle and grandsparkle, <laughs> the parents of his spunkle Joseph, obviously. <laughs> every milestone with obvious delight and forward the emails I send them containing pictures of him to a truly astonishing number of people. <laughs> they seem to have no concern whatsoever about explaining to all and sundry that their son, the heteroflexible rabbi, has made a kind of queer family with two trans guys via both intention and sperm and is now known to a rambunctious three-year-old as Spunkle Joseph. <laughs> Spunkle, by the way, is a portmanteau word made up of sperm and uncle. It was coined by some of our very earnest lesbian friends, one of whom is my husband's oldest friend in the world, they do not appear to have noticed that this word also contains the word spunk. <laughs> and is therefore a little giggle word. <laughs> Especially with the papers. Uh, it's their son Eli who, in his retelling of the Nativity story, relates. Mary wanted to have a baby, so she asked her friends for a cup of sperm. <laughs> because in Eli's world, that's how babies are made. It's hard to argue. The world around Stanley is even more robust than he knows. <coughs> because he's still little and the people come around one or two at a time. He's never been able to play with all his cousins at once. He has no idea how deep he is in Mishpaka. No idea how many people claim him as their own. Which is, of course, exactly what I want for him. And we fly places and have Skype dates and do all manner of things to keep him connected and deepen the connections that exist. We make Shabbos even when we're exhausted, because that's where the magic happens. Where the same faces appear over and over, where new friends and new jokes and new stories come to the table, where the old things get pulled out and polished and used with a certain mixture of reverence and workaday trust in their abilities. <coughs> where every object and person and relationship has a story. Where it came from, <coughs> how we met it, what we thought at first, what we understand to be true now. We tell and retell the stories so he'll have heard them a million times before he's old enough to tell them even once. And so he understands how much the story of a person or a thing can add to the enjoyment of them. But maybe most of all, so we can pull them out and polish them too. Tighten them up a little bit as storytellers always and instinctively will with a joke or story every time they tell it. Make it just a little better. Make it a little more beautiful. With each retelling, fulfilling the obligation <coughs> of Hidor Mitzvah, making every story <coughs> as beautiful as possible, in praise to Hashem, who has blessed us a million times <coughs> with the winding of our stories together.